Welcome to the Bonnie Forward Show. I'm your host, Bonnie Forward. And being as it's getting close to Halloween, I could not think of a more appropriate person to have as my guest on the show today than the producer and writer, Alan Katz, best known for his work on Tales from the Crypt, Outer Limits, All Things Horror, Imagined, and most recently, True Horror, as you will learn about as we delve into his latest podcast ventures. So without further ado, welcome, Alan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Bonnie. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. I know. Well, we met at HorrorCon. Indeed, but uh, now we actually have some FaceTime. Yeah, we do. So let us begin with, why don't you start by telling my audience a little bit about yourself? I, I came from the East Coast. I'm an East Coaster. I I, uh, I grew up in Baltimore. I went to school in New York. I went to Vassar. And uh, I, I graduated from Vassar in 1981. And I, I was a drama major. Uh, and I thought I was going to be an actor. I went to one audition. And I thought, what kind of an idiot tries to make their living this way? And I thought, I, I, the only other skill set I had was I could write. And I thought, I'll go do that instead, like, like that's less idiotic. Yes. <laughs> but I, I started out in New York um, making training films, industrial scripts. I had a friend from high school named Carol Yunkus who had become an agent at William Morris in Los Angeles. And she said, why don't you uh, write a screenplay? And, and I'd I been know. toying. I'd been toying with the idea and I wrote a thing called Down to Earth and I sent it to her and she said, this is, this is really good. You should come out and meet and greet people. And so in June of 1985, I headed out to Los Angeles for a week. Now, I was a total New Yorker at this point. I was, to me, theater was where I wanted to be. That's what I wanted to do. Los Angeles was the stupidest place on the whole planet. It was the land of the avocado head, but, but for a week, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I flew out to LA for a week in June 1985. And well, first of all, it was 1985. It was, a, it was a lot different. It was a lot less crowded. And well, the people were so nice. And oh, gosh, the meetings, it's, having people blow smoke up your ass is really, is a very pleasant experience. Uh, one night, my agent took me to a movie premiere, St. Elmo's Fire. Heady, heady stuff. Uh, one morning, I had the morning off. I didn't have any meetings. And someone suggested I take a drive through Topanga Canyon. And so I did. And this was 1985, not nearly as built up as it is now. Right. right. And traveling from the 101 down towards the ocean. And you're traveling in the city limits through mountains as they plunge into the ocean. And by the time I got to, San, to, the, to the Pacific Coast Highway, fuck New York, man. <laughs> I, I had totally sold my soul to Los Angeles. <laughs> and the very next month I found a place to, I moved, I came out again, found a place to live. And the very next month in August, I came out and I have lived here and I've never looked back. Now, one of the first people I met that very first week was a guy named Gil Adler. Okay. And Gil, very shortly after after I moved here, we became creative partners and we wrote some stuff, a lot of things together. And ultimately, Gil was HBO's favored producer because he had, he had gotten them out of budgetary problems on a couple of shows. He produced The Hitchhiker for them, nice. really pulled the bacon out of the fire on a thing called Vietnam War Stories. Oh. And a show called Tales from the Crypt had had started. They'd done two seasons. And after the second season, well, the executive producers had not put it together like a TV show. And, and we'll come to that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, normally the way you make a TV show, because the, that first run license fee or even the second run is not going to pay for the cost of production. It right, just isn't. Yeah. And so the whole structure of most TV was based on, on, it was based on syndication. And so there was a deficit partner that would help you, you know, pay for the whole thing to get the syndication in the hopes of getting their money back. And syndication with the magic number is always 65, 65 right. episodes to get syndication. Right. All right. Um, but uh, they didn't have a deficit partner. HBO was paying for all the overages over the course right. of season two. 
And the night before the rap party, the executive producers, Joel Silver, Richard Donner, Bob Zemeckis, and Walter Hill were handed a financials financial statement from HBO that said, you're a million dollars cash in the hole. Get out your checkbook, folks, boys. And they did. Well, after the first thing they did was cancel the rap party. Then they got out their checkbooks. <laughs> That's the thing you're supposed to keep, not cancel. <laughs> so Gil and I got hired to come aboard season three of Tales from the Crypt, ostensibly to see it to its end. Season three was supposed to be the end of Tales from the Crypt. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was supposed to be the end of it. But something happened over the course of season three. Gil and I had different ideas about it. Now, Gil and I, neither of us are horror guys. We're comedy guys. Mm -hmm. And the script, the, everything we wrote together was comedy. And I grew up a lover of easy comics, mm -hmm. of Mad Magazine and before that, and, and, and the original Tales from the Crypt comics. I, I that was that was part of how I understood the world, and I loved Bill Gaines's vision and just his his whole creative approach, and I I, I loved it, mm -hmm. and so I something in me understood this material and. If we had more time, I would tell you the story of where I first, well, I'll, I'll try to squeeze this in. I'll try to go. Okay. Yeah. Cause hopefully we can mix it in with how you got yeah. started with your fascination for horror and well, who hired you. Uh, uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, a year before I got Tales from the Crypt, uh, about a year and a half before, mm -hmm. I was an unemployed writer, like so many writers in this town. And I got, I asked to do, uh, there used to be a thing called the Cable Ace Awards. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to be a Cable Ace Award judge as a writer. And so a, a dozen writers were, we were in a hotel suite in Century City. Mm -hmm. And we were going to be there for eight, nine hours. And they gave us a list of everything that we were going to be seeing that day. And the first 90 minutes of our very long day, uh, these 12 of us saw what's going to be the first three episodes of Tales from the Crypt, uh, oh, Dick Donner's okay. Dig This Caddy's Real Gone, Bob Zemeckis is All Through the House, and Walter Hill's The Man Who Was Death. Mm -hmm. And every single one of us writers, we looked at, the, at, at these, at what our day was going to begin as, and we all went, oh, fuck, there's 90 minutes we're never going to get back. And we thought, ah. oh, this horror, this is going to be, uh, uh. The first episode that rolled was Dick Donner's Dig This Caddy's Real Gone, which is fucking brilliant. Okay. It is so, it's, it's, it's scary. Yeah, I, I don't know the tales from the crypt is scary. It's, we're, we're little dark, twisted morality tales. Yeah. Where somebody gets, you know, someone who, who deserves a kind of justice gets a kind of yeah. poetic justice in the most ironic, disgusting way possible. <laughs> my, which brings to mind my favorite, which was Bordello of Blood. Oh, uh, well, well, we will Dennis come Miller to that. And Corey Feldman. That was fabulous. With a little guest star appearance by a very young Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. I mean, that was a uh, lot of comedy in that. Miller was amazing. Uh, I love oh, that. One. And I feel like I'm in a bad Tales from the Crypt episode. <laughs> oh, we, 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 we will come to that. So uh, when Gil and I went aboard, the goal was to reinvest that core Bill Gainsness into uh -huh. the show itself. But the other thing that I wanted to do, the first 25 episodes, the first two seasons of Tales from the Crypt, the Crypt Keeper, he basically sits in the same outfit in the same set, really rehashing the same right. puns. Right. Right. My question was, all right, so what does the Crypt Keeper do at the end of his day when he punches the clock and he goes home to his crypt? What is he? What are his hobbies? What does he like to eat for dinner? What does he watch on TV? Who are his friends? And because one of my jobs was going to be to write what the Crypt Keeper said, my first question was, well, who the fuck is he? Yeah. Yeah. You cannot write for a character that doesn't exist. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to write generic stuff. Yeah. Which is what they had the first two seasons. So my. What I wanted to do was to create an interior life for nice. him. Nice, nice. Well, it, what that did, you know, the Crypt Keeper was, the puppet was created by Kevin Yeager. Right. The voice is John Kassir. Right. But it wasn't until he had an interior life 
that he went from being the puppet that opened and closed Tales from the Crypt to being the franchise oh, worth true. money. Yeah, that's true. Suddenly there were advertisers. Budweiser Beer wanted the Crypt Keeper. And suddenly it, after, after the fact, there were children's shows and game shows. There were all kinds of aftermarket things that flowed not from Tales from the Crypt or the EC Comics. It flowed from the Crypt Keeper. And those things didn't flow from the puppet and they didn't flow strictly from John's voice. They flowed from the interior life that he suddenly had after a certain point in time. And that's all and so, because of you. <laughs> yes. One of the things that, that, yeah, that, that it took me a while to realize and that I needed to, to claim a little credit for, frankly, in this, the way the world works is I co-created the Crypt Keeper. That's right. I, I didn't create his physical image or do his voice, but without that interior life, we're not talking about him in the present exactly. tense. We're exactly. not. Exactly. Now, I'm going to jump way, way, way forward in time. After the fact, that Tales from the Crypt was gone from the stage for 25 years. It was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And th that was one of the first inklings of people said, try, but why don't they redo Tales from the Crypt? And there are reasons why it, it's taken so long to happen. But there's, there's beginning to, to come together. M. Night Shyamalan wanted to redo Tales from the Crypt as part of a, a, a horror wheel that TNT was going to do. And so he optioned the EC Comics. What he didn't understand was that the Crypt Keeper in the EC Comics is an old white guy with stringy hair. Exactly. It's not the Crypt Keeper in the TV series. They're two separate pieces of intellectual property of IP. Okay. And while he had optioned Tales from the Crypt, he, he, the Crypt Keeper is owned by Joel Silver and Dick Donner and the Crypt Partners. Yeah. You don't get that with Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. And at that time, and until very recently, even now, um, Joel Silver is a very hard person to work with and for. Okay. Joel is very, very difficult person. And yeah, at some point, a lot of people end up hating him. Oh. And yeah. after a certain point, the, the Gaines family, Bill Gaines died and his widow and his children, they recognized that Joel was fucking them financially and they, they took offense and they would never work with Joel ever again, which means Tales from the Crypt, the EC Comics and the Crypt Keeper are permanently divorced and nothing new will ever be created because they're separate. Oh, man. All right. Okay. Hey, but this is, that is part of the nature of this business. All right. But what are from, cons so what TV shows of those are you the most proud of? Well, how many did you do? 53 or something like that? I ultimately was responsible for about 70 or so episodes. Oh. You know, I, I, I produced, I was, until our last season, I was the I was the only writer on this show, and so I I was everything had to flow through me. I was the keeper. Not only did I write every word the crypt keeper ever said, I was the I was the keeper of of the franchise flame, and so every script had to go through me before, or most scripts would go through me before they would hit the stage. There were a couple of exceptions. Uh, one of the other writers who did a lot of work on the show was a guy named Scott Nimmerfro. Okay. Who went on to have a tremendous career in in in, in TV, uh, 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 pushing daisies, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Hannibal. Yeah. I mean, just and unfortunately, Scott passed a, a couple of years ago. But Scott, he he was uh, Richard Donner's head of development, and and uh, he, he also just had a he understood the material. And after my first season on the show, I recognized that my best strategy with scott is to let scott do whatever he wants because i can't improve on scott he's just he was just he was wonderful he he was very midwestern in his sensibilities mm -hmm. and it was after a couple of years after tales in the crypt was done i, I worked with scott on, on we wrote a couple of screenplays together we did a couple of episodes of of uh, down of, of uh, outer limits together uh, it was great fun working with Scott, putting our two very different sensibilities together. It, it produced some really, oh, some stuff that I'm very fond of. On Tales from the Crypt, the episodes that I'm, you know, they're the ones that I wrote and the Gill directed. There's Death of Some Salesmen, which where Tim Curry plays three 
three members of the same family. Uh, and, you know, for Gil and I, Crypt was an opportunity to, to expand our creative horizons. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, Gil got a chance to, to direct and do more complicated things, like the work it took to get uh, Death of Some Salesmen done. Uh, the episode uh, 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 What's Cooking with Christopher Reeve um, um, and, and Meatloaf, <laughs> playing Meatloaf, <laughs> playing playing meat <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, I'm really, <laughs> I'm very fond of that episode because to me, nothing is funnier than cannibalism. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing about Tales from the Crypt, that, why we were able to revive it and and midway through this our our first season season three everyone recognized that the series was rejuvenated we suddenly we were getting a-list actors to come in who wanted to come in and and, and act in the show sure and hey suddenly we were about to get kirk douglas yeah. to come in and do yellow bob zemeckis's remake of of uh of paths of glory yeah which also starred kirk douglas yeah and so suddenly it just there's a, got a life there's, of a own. there's a story that John Kassir tells about the, the first the cast and crew screening of the first three episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a couple of press people there. And after the first episode rolled, one of the the crew members leaned over to the other one and said, wow, this is great TV. And the other one said, it's not TV, it's HBO. And the HBO executives in the row ahead turned and they had just heard their not just their slogan, but the mantra mm -hmm. of what, you know, previous to Tales from the Crypt, HBO had done some other shows. They had done like First in Ten, uh, 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 the, the Hitchhiker, right. but they were TV, they were still TV shows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, they would, they would have, or maybe they'd have tits in the word fuck, but they were still TV shows. They were still inside that box. Yeah. And when Joel and Dick and Bob and Walter approached HBO, the idea was, to take a feature film vision and put it inside the little box. Yeah, which is bad. And that's what changed HBO. It was taking the grand vision yep. and put it, it's not TV, it's HBO. Yeah. We changed, literally our show changed their culture and the way that they saw themselves. Brilliant. And yeah. at the end of the day, HBO changed television because oh, they made the subscription model work mm -hmm. and they began to win awards and prestige and for quite a while loyalty from, from their subscriber base which and it was hbo's success that created the the other people the other subscription services that followed but that's what suddenly made netflix and its leap into streaming now, all, the all, services. all subscriber based <laughs> which was a very different model. Mm -hmm. We'll come to that. All right. When Gil and I did Tales from the Crypt, we changed the course. They suddenly began to order more seasons. And not only did the show suddenly become a hit, Universal ordered, hey, why don't we do a couple of Tales from the Crypt feature films? And we said, yeah, we're down with that. And the first film that we did was, I think, a terrific movie called Demon Knight. Yes. Well, I see it right over your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which <laughs> Ernest Dickerson directed with Billy Zane. He's a yeah. he's wonderful man. That that is a classic movie. That really is a that's it a is. that's a great horror movie. Yeah. We Gil was supposed to direct the first movie, but they wanted a monster movie, and Gil didn't want to do a monster movie. We didn't want to do a monster movie. We wanted to we wanted the features to be our way out of horror. Okay. And so we had developed. <clears throat> but they were horror movies. Yeah. Well, I mean, we Demon the, Knight was a horror movie. Yes, and that's why we Gil didn't want to direct it and and you know, we we produced it. Okay. But you know, but we didn't but that again Gil didn't want to if Gil was going to direct it this was going to be a much more personal project that we really were invested in uh, okay, more deeply it. than just as as got the producers it. and the keepers of the tales from, of the tales from yeah. the crypt. Flame. Okay, the second movie we were supposed to make, this other thing called Dead Easy. We were not supposed to make Bordello of Blood. Bordello no. of Blood was never on our radar. But it was so we good. To, 
we were supposed to make when we were supposed to make a movie called Dead Easy, a, a psychological horror, a psychological thriller with a wonderful horror villain, a, a, a harlequin. And it took place in the swamps outside New Orleans, a really creepy atmospheric piece. Uh, we spent six weeks in New Orleans prepping it and three weeks before the start of principal photography, Universal got us on the phone and said, come home, come back to Los Angeles. You're not making dead easy. You're going to make this thing called Bordello of Blood instead. Oh, OK. Sorry. Now, the reason we were going to make Bordello of Blood instead and, and, and this was crushing because this was a movie, literally the entire crew was invested in. We we were this was a movie we all saw as point A to point B or maybe even point C. So now we're why Bordello of Blood? OK, at about this time, there was a brand new company being uh, that had just formed called DreamWorks. Of and DreamWorks DreamWorks was Steven Spielberg leaving his deal with Universal, staying on the lot, but being a separate company. Yep. And as new companies do, he began to make deals with talent. And Universal was desperately afraid that they would lose a second big piece of talent, Bob Zemeckis, yeah. because Steve was Bob's mentor. Yeah. And Universal approached Bob and they said, we're at Universal, what can we do to prove you how much we love you? I don't know any other part of that deal. It must be good enough because Bob stayed. I know of one deal point. Yeah. That Universal was was told to purchase the first student script that Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale ever wrote together at USC when they were film school students. It was called Bordello of Blood. And the purchase price was half a million dollars for a student script. That was a lot then. Yes, it was. And Universal then having paid that money thought, well, geez, are we just going to eat this? Or, hey, wait a minute. They thought. Bob's executive producing a horror movie called Dead Easy. Well, fuck that script. That's $50,000 we spent. Fuck, take that out of the budget. Nobody's going to give a shit. Yeah. And hey, Bob Zemeckis' name on a horror movie script was better than my name or Gil's name on a horror movie script. Couldn't argue with that. So from a business point of view, yeah, it, it, you kind of get it. But from a creative point of view, it's all wrong. Our release date didn't change, they reminded us, and we were still going to start principal photography in three weeks on a movie whose script we had just been handed. Yeah. Now, here, let, let me give you That's some, some, impossible. Now, let me give you some of the problems just from the creative point of view, because uh, look, the, the movie that, 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 that got churned out at the end is one thing. Yeah. The process of making Bordello of Blood was my personal Waterloo. It, it destroyed me. It destroyed me. All right. Uh, the why the the he like said we had three weeks to 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 rewrite a script that to begin with made no sense. It's about a small town detective. Now, just think about it. How much business can a detective make in a small town? Not enough to survive. He's a, a literal contradiction. He can't exist. And so how do you write a guy? Where does he come from? What, where's, especially if you're going to try to write comedy, mm -hmm. you have to, it's got to come from character. Otherwise it's generic and, and there was no character to write from. We, and I had three weeks to rewrite my boss. I had three weeks to rewrite Bob Zemeckis. Now, Bob was very gracious because this was not his intention. He did not want this to happen. Yeah. But once it began to happen, it was happening. And Bob said, look, don't worry. Just do whatever you need to do. You know, I'm totally behind you. And Bob, as always, I loved working for Bob Zemeckis. Yeah. Making Yellow for Bob. When I went aboard, Bob, the idea was to he wanted to make yellow, but he needed Kirk Douglas. And the script that had been written by the Thompson twins didn't get Kirk Douglas. It wasn't well, he wouldn't submit it even to William Morris, their agent, because it wasn't good enough. It just it was it was all surface. And so Bob turned to me because that was my job was to make all the scripts work mm -hmm. and said, can you make this work? And I did. And we got Kirk Douglas. And yeah. so Bob became a fan. <clears throat> and when Bob went to do his last episode a couple of years later, he called me, he said, will you write this for me? I said, well, okay. 
<laughs> working with Bob is incredible because Bob will will throw down a creative challenge that seems utterly impossible. And they'll say, all right, guys, how are we going to do this? Now, Bob has ideas about how we're going to do this, but he really wants to see what you're going to put on the table. Yeah. And there are no there are no bad ideas. Mm-hmm. There are ideas that might not work all the way through, but hey, this contribution and that contribution, and suddenly the group, well, next thing you know, the whole group is invested. It's yeah. not, this is, yeah. this is our thing. And yeah. everyone owns yeah. a piece of it. I love it. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's... So the problem with, all right, we, we had a character that was unwritable. And then Joel took over and insisted on casting the three leads himself. Okay. The reason we shot, you know, we, then we, went to, we shot the film in Vancouver. We left Los Angeles because Joel was always at war with the IA, the, the union that represented our crew. And sometimes Joel was up and sometimes the IA was up. And at that particular point, the IA was up and they just delivered a big fuck you to Joel. They had struck a movie, that uh, a TV movie that we had done for, for Fox. And so Joel's attitude was, fuck me, no, fuck you. Yeah, exactly. And so we, he, he took the movie out of Los Angeles, uh, uh, Los Angeles, away from our loyal crew to Vancouver for no other reason than the fact that it was not in Los Angeles. Yeah, but that's runaway production and nobody likes that. Oh, indeed. But it gets stupider because it was July. Ah. We went we went to shoot a horror movie in Vancouver in July. Horror movies, you know what you need a lot of? Night. You know what you don't get a lot of in Vancouver in July? Night. Because it doesn't turn shootable dark that's until right. midnight. That's right. And suddenly, suddenly at four o'clock in the morning, it's like, oh, look, it's light again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the if you rem- if you recall, the climax of the movie takes place in a glass church. Yes, I know. <laughs> but you made it work. Every day on that movie was stupider than the day before. I I didn't want to <laughs> cast Dennis. Uh, honestly, I did not want to cast Dennis. And uh, but he worked. We, oh, I don't know about that, Dennis. We had a half a million dollars in the budget. Dennis did not want to do the movie in any way, shape, or form. And so he said, well, yeah, give me a million dollars, figuring no one in their right fucking mind would pay Dennis, million, Dennis Miller a million dollars to be in or maybe his show. But the HBO wasn't paying him a million dollars either for his right, show. Right, right. But Joel, for some reason, said yes to this day. I cannot tell you why. I was never, ever given an explanation as Are to why friends? Dennis Miller. Were they friends? No, not that I know of. Okay. I don't, I don't know why. Now, I didn't have that extra half a million in my budget and universal said, well, we don't give a fuck about Dennis Miller. My audience was there for horror was there for special effects makeup. They didn't care about Dennis Miller. Yeah. And so universal said, take it out of your budget. I'm a $13 million movie. You know where that half a million dollars came out of my special effects makeup? Cause that's where all the money was. So I took the money out of special effects makeup to pay for an actor. I didn't want in the first place. Yeah. But from- Dennis was a good gumshoe, you know, and that's kind of the way I looked at it. He was different from everybody else in that movie. He looked different. He was the plain Joe, you know. That oh, I'm sure. Thing. And just I, he was. Just I can only, I can only see the actor who showed up on my set and and made every other actor and the whole crew hate Uh-oh. him. Uh oh. Because Dennis, you know, he was doing his HBO show at the time. He was doing his HBO show. Oh, I know. I remember. And now I should point out, I tell this whole story that I'm telling you. If, if you want to really hear the whole thing, I do a podcast called How Not to Make a Movie Podcast. And yeah. the first and season, the, the, first, the first five episodes of the How Not to Make a Movie Podcast, oh, I go into surgical detail. Yes. And every last bit of this story from the very beginning to the very bitter, bitter end. And there are some twists and turns. Sylvester Stallone plays a part because, hey, we hired his girlfriend. To be yeah. in the movie. We d- didn't want her either, but that wasn't up to us. It was up to Joel. No, well, there we you go. Him. We begged him not to make us to, not to make us do that. You know. So talk, let's we... talk about your podcasts. The one that That's... fascinates me the most is the DNA horror story. Oh, okay. So let's hear about that. After, after a couple of seasons of doing the How Not to Make a Movie podcast, a friend of mine approached me with a, a story. He was a friend from school that I grew up with and he wanted to write a screenplay about something that had happened to him while he was working his way through med school in the mid 1980s. 
he paid his way. He made some money as an anonymous sperm donor. He became a successful radiologist and jumped forward 25 plus years. And he's now a successful radiologist. And a new company called 23andMe suddenly comes into being. Mm -hmm. And he thinks, that's cool. I can send in my DNA and see about my, my health. Oh, yes. Yeah, your relatives. Yeah. Didn't, didn't occur to him what the larger implications were of submitting his DNA to a growing DNA database. He lost his donor anonymity and suddenly seven total strangers found daddy, except six of them had no idea their actual biological father was a sperm donor. Oh, my God. That's, that is the donor, a, a, a DNA horror story. That's it is seven episodes. It is you have never heard a story like this before. And it's absolutely true. It will curl your hair. Oh my God. Uh, just the thought of it curls my hair. My hair is very curly. Uh, but uh, that's brilliant. Wow. Wow. So when I so did everybody that, everybody needs I, to tune in and watch both those. How the donor, the donor pod, it, the donor podcast.com. It's really simple to go to. And it, it's like seven episodes. You've never heard a story like this. Oh, I can't. Uh, well, suddenly I, I thought, you know, I really love podcasting. As storytelling goes, it's the film and TV business are so fucked up these days. Trying to get anything from, from your head out into the world is so hard. There are so many people standing in your way. But you know what I found doing the podcast, doing the donor, there was only ever one asshole standing in my way and it was me. <laughs> and that I could get it out to the audience. Now I have to do all the work to sell it, but okay, I'm, yeah, that's I'm, fine. Game, I'm yeah. game with that. Yeah. And I, as a storyteller, I find podcasting so rewarding. And if you hear the way that, that I, I, I tell it, you know, it, it's not just people talking. There's, I, I bring everything I learned about making movies and TV shows into what's really making a radio show. Nice. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And I just, <laughs> I mean, oh, a chew. The, a chew. <laughs> what I especially love about podcasting, when I was making TV shows, when I first got into the TV business, mm -hmm. and the 65 was what you had to get to a show that could be an idea, excuse me, that was repeatable 65 times in essence. But the, the thing that was going to really make it work was that the characters and their world was, people used to watch TV in their living rooms. Remember back then? Oh, yeah. And people, these all were going to be invited into your living room, right. into their living rooms on a weekly basis. Right. Podcasting borrows a very significant part of that. People invite you between their ears. Yes, exactly. Into a very intimate space. Exactly. And- and the better you can, excuse me, the better you can facilitate yes. them. It's like audibles. It's like audible books. Uh, well, it's to create a, a, a product, the way of telling a story that it kind of tells it from the inside in, from the inside out, and really uses the medium to fullest effect, recognizing first and foremost, it's intimacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you do. You, so do you have various guests or do you have a situation where you dialogue with other people or you? And what, you what would I do? Most of my the podcast that I have a little company called Costard and Touchstone Productions and Costard and Touchstone produces the how not to make a movie podcast, which is every week. Come okay. rain or come oh, shine. Cool. Every that is that is I've been doing it for three years. I've got one hundred and twenty five plus episodes. Nice. It's every single week, rain or shine, I, I will do that podcast. It doesn't matter. So, and that one, I've never advertised it. It's, it's my, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I told my story and it, I interview everyone I know in the film business. And we talk about the nuts and bolts of the, of the craft of making this stuff. And what Good. happens when sometimes the craft turns to crap as it did with the making of Bordello and Blood. So after the first season, it just became a, a really, a a, converse, a conversation with everyone I know in the business about doing what we do. Great. So tell our audience again how they can best access. All right. Uh, 
there's the how not to make a movie podcast at how, how uh, I wish that one was easier to, to uh, the donor podcast.com is, is easy to find. Uh, and that ultimately will link you to everything else that uh, Costard and Touchstone is doing. We've got a couple other podcasts that are about to drop in December. We've got one called prisoner X, which is about uh, uh, people who are here uh, that are prisoners here in America and around the world, but who shouldn't be. Yeah. And the goal of the podcast is not just to tell their stories, but to to empower the audience into how they can make these prisoners ex prisoners. And yeah, it, it, John Grisham just came out with a book called Framed. Yeah, yeah. It, Sounds it, it's like you the, could tie that in there. Yeah, it is. The, the full title is Prisoner X with John Kiriakou. John Kiriakou was is a former is a an ex CIA officer during our war on terror when we were looking for the. Uh, Al Qaeda's leadership. We thought we had captured the number three, a guy named Abu Zubaydah mm -hmm. in Pakistan. And for the first sixty hours that we held Abu Zubaydah, John Kiriakou was his handler. Okay. And it turned out Abu Zubaydah was not the number three at Al Qaeda. He was not part of Al Qaeda. He was not a prince, but he wasn't part of Al Qaeda. Uh, and he gave us some very important intelligence, regardless of the fact that he did do that and he wasn't Al Qaeda. We waterboarded him eighty-three times. And when John learned about that, he he ratted out the 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 torture program that the CIA was running and spent 23 months in federal prison. So John knows from experience what it is to be a prisoner who should not be a prisoner. Yeah. And the first episode is about Abu Zubaydah, who okay. to this day it languishes in at Gitmo at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. So uh, that is uh, that'll be about eight, nine episodes. These are all limited series. The most of the rest of these will not be, you know, weak. Weekly, there'll be limited series around of about eight, nine episodes. Uh, I've got another one called The Hall Closet, which is a true crime from inside. From uh, This is Donna Hall grew up in a lower tier crime family outside Philadelphia. They weren't the Corleones. They were several tiers down, but they made national headlines with their criminal behavior nonetheless. And Donna somehow survived this with this incredible grace and a sense of humor She's a wonderful storyteller. And the first yeah. couple episodes, my goal is the way that I want to do this in December, when we've got five episodes in the can, we'll start dropping them. And hopefully by the time we get to the 10th episode, we'll just be in time with, with the production. We'll just be in, Excellent. in time with. So that's how I, I want, how my company wants to begin to release these things. We've got a dozen other podcasts in, in various stages of development Excellent. We, we love podcasting. We love. Well, it. we're going to have to interview you again, Alan Katz, because I could go on endlessly talking about all of this real horror, which you would just describe with the podcasting, but we have to wrap up the show. So sadly, but you know, Halloween is around the corner. So we got to get our pumpkins carved. <laughs> As they say, I thank you so very much for being my guest today, Alan. It was such a pleasure. It was my pleasure and really a, a, such a pleasure to meet you. And, uh, uh, you know, you're going to come do my podcast. I would love it. I well, would love it. Having grown up on. in this business my whole life, I would love that. <laughs> uh, all, after this is finished and, and we're, we're on the outside of this, let's, let's set a date. Let's talk. Okay. For reals. Yes, absolute okay. amol. All right, darling. Well, that's the end of our show. So I'm going to let you go. And happy Halloween, everybody. And as always, love and light and peace out.